Hello everyone, I'm back here again. A warm welcome to the exciting you know, test new conference day three. We are almost near end of the day three. It's a little sad, but yeah, you have a lot of learning over the past few days. For those of you who don't know me, I am Manoj, I'm the host for this session. Uh, I'm leading our developer relations and office of open source at the test. It's a great pleasure for me to introduce our speaker today, who is a good friend of mine. We've been hanging out with a lot of times in conferences um, at the Selenium team. It's none other than Titus, Titus Faulkner. Hey, Titus, welcome. Hey, thanks. Thanks for having me. Amazing. So Titus is going to talk to us about transitive testing. The session will give deep dive insight and learning on how to effortlessly manage your test data, right? Like the overall test. So those of you who have been maintaining a lot of Selenium tests, I'm sure you would have faced a lot of issues in this. So manage your test data, you know, amplify reliability within, you know, progress of risk point. And definitely it will help you elevate your testing game through enhanced parallelization. So Titus is going to bring in a lot of those insights to you. I'm sure he's one of those experts who has done enough Selenium in his life so far. Um, so he'll bring you some of those best insights. So that's about the title um, and the topic, but I'm sure you want to know about Titus himself, right? So our speaker Titus is an open source software developer and a core contributor to um, Selenium and Water. Um, the, he has done uh, interesting things before getting into the tech world. I, mean, I think he is unsatisfied with life either as a submarine officer or a semiconductor engineer. And I believe this is his third career, brought him into tech world where he fell in love with the process of developing software now with testing specifically, and right now he's a senior developer advocate at Source Labs. He's done multiple things, isn't it? Impressive. Titus is passionate about building communities and um, is doing amazing things with Selenium team and for Source Labs. And uh, is super glad and awesome to have you here, Titus. With no further ado, please join me in welcoming Titus. Over Great, to you. thank you. Yeah, appreciate it. All right. So let me share my screen here. See if I can, let's window. Where'd it go? We had this working a second ago. There we go. I can click this and share. Let me switch back to this and yeah, maximize can see it. All right, can you hear me all right? Can you see it all okay? Perfect. All right. So all of the code that I'm gonna be showing, it's not a workshop, this is just a, uh, a talk, but it's got a lot of code in it. And so I put the code on GitHub and have a few commits of some interesting things and the, a copy of uh, a PDF of all of these slides is in the version 1.0 release. All right, so it was already introduced. Uh, thank you very much, Manoj. Really excited to be here. Um, I'm one of the, the primary authors of Selenium right now, so I've been doing a lot of work pushing it forward. If you haven't been using Selenium 4.11, please update. There's a lot of really cool things going on there, uh, and hopefully we'll get Selenium 4.12 out like in the next day or two. I wanted to get it out last week, but too much stuff going on. So hopefully very soon uh, we'll start, we'll have like Firefox automatic downloads the same way we've had Chrome automatic downloads. So exciting things. Um, I've been at Sauce Labs for about seven years now, seeing a lot of customer code, and I'm now in a more community-facing role. All right, let's move forward. So I like this slide as a way to start because it kind of resets us to think about why we do what we do. A lot of times we get really tied up into our specific world and how many of our tests are passing and things like that without really thinking about what is the point of testing? What is the point of our jobs? Um, the money is the board of directors. This is the shareholders. This is the CEO. Uh, these are the people that they don't care how many of your tests are passing. They probably don't even care if your continuous delivery or what kind of your exploratory testing plan looks like. None of that really matters. They want to make sure that they've got users. They want those users to spend time and money on their site. They want users to keep coming back. They want users to tell other people that they should be using the website. How do we help the money get and maintain uh, users? 
mostly this is about speed. Mostly this is about new releases coming out with new features and fixes and improvements. And this need for speed, this need for being able to release more quickly, wherever you're at on the maturity scale or continuous delivery, or just trying to get to a release every few weeks or release a month, being able to release faster keeps you more competitive. It also poses a problem for how we've traditionally tested. Manual testers, human testers are different from computers. And I'm going to phrase this in a way I don't normally. With humans, the more people you have testing a site, the more coverage you have looking at what is available, the more information, the more usable information, useful, worthwhile information you get. Automation, on the other hand, if you're focusing on coverage, and this is where a lot of managers, coverage, 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 if you're focusing on coverage with automation, you actually end up with less information, less usable information. And the reason is that if you're focused on coverage, you're not focused on reliability. When you don't have reliability in your test suites, that means you have, you know, I've seen people 30, 40, 50, 70% failures. So they run a test suite and just so much fails. And when so much fails, there are real bugs that are going to get through because you don't have time to look at all of those failures. So if you're not focused on reliability and the accuracy of your tests, all of that coverage is worthless. And I think this approach sums it up well of the three main costs of doing a test automation in general, uh, maintenance costs, creation costs, and execution costs. And when we're thinking about coverage, we're focused on creation costs. And oftentimes I'll have you know customers or people say, hey, can you help me decrease how much time it takes to run a test? And I'm like, sure, but out of curiosity, what's your failure rate? Literally, I had a customer a couple of years ago say 70%. I'm <laughs> like, why do you want me to get you completely worthless results a few hours faster every day? That's, that's insane. Uh, Maintenance costs are so much more expensive than the combination of creation and execution costs. If you're not focused on how do we have a set of tests that are reliable, that are giving us useful information that we can keep up with. It doesn't matter if you've got really great test automation one week, if there's a big site redesign and everything breaks the next week. You have to have maintainable tests. You have to be focusing on the things that make a difference. So how do we get the most information that's maintainable for the least cost? We need to figure out how to provide reliability and accuracy with velocity. And there are three things that I think really go into this approach. One is atomic. So atomic tests means you're focusing on one specific feature at a time. And I'll show an example in a bit. Autonomous means that you're using independent data, that each test, that any given test can be run by itself in any order with any other test at the same time as any other test, really making sure that everything, that the results of one thing don't affect the results of another or the execution of another. And then parallel, this is just making sure that you are able to take the atomic autonomous tests and then execute them as many at the same time as possible uh, to get, this is where you, you end up getting the, uh, the first two are how to get things reliable. And the third one is how to now scale it up so that you're getting the results that you need in a timely fashion. So my test address book site, the problem I have with a lot of demo websites out there for testing things is that they're either API testing or they're UI testing. I haven't come across something that does a good job of allowing me to both authentic. So I think the bare minimum for evaluating how your, your testing code does is you need to be able to evaluate both authentication and then CRUD. And by CRUD, I mean the create, read, update, delete. These are the things that you have for almost all websites. Your, 
you're creating some kind of authentication and then using that authentication to set state and manipulate state in the application. And this is something that most e-commerce demo sites don't provide. So the problem with my test address book site right now is that Heroku decided to unceremoniously delete it. And so I have it working locally, but I have not been able to update the libraries that I need to to get it remote. And I am working on that. But for, for now, uh, all of the code works, trust me, um, it works against my local, uh, local host. So as we're going through this address book site, this is an example of a journey. This is what a manual tester would do as they're going through the site. They're gonna navigate, navigate, submit a form, verify that the form was correct in all of the different ways, verify signing out, signing in, navigating to the address list, creating an address, verifying it, editing, like all of those things. This is essentially authentication and CRUD writ large. Now, when I code this out, it looks like this. Now, this is a small test. This doesn't take too long to, to get through, actually. It, I've seen tests that are 10 times this size, right? Like you have these big, long journeys, these flows throughout the site where you are starting at the beginning and, and taking actions and setting state and, and then traveling all the way through to, to see how the results go. The problem with these journeys is what happens if it fails at the one minute mark? right? The, the next nine minutes of information you lose. Or what if it fails at the six minute mark? Like you've, I've seen people with, well, I've seen hour long tests, but that's kind of ridiculous. Like 30 minute tests are unfortunately common. And you see someone with a problem at the 20 minute mark, you now have to step through 20 minutes of things to try and get to the state to figure out if it's a real problem or not. And also what's the error you're getting? It's a selenium error. It's element not found. How often does element not found error actually tell you what you care about? It's, it's always the element after the thing that broke that you, it can't find. The, the stack trace is always to the step and a method and a page object that's after the one that broke. It, it is difficult to maintain tests that are long that don't give you good information when they fail. So when we're thinking about how do we get the maximum information with the least cost, something that's eminently maintainable, let's pull out some specific features. Like we're avoiding the navigations, we're avoiding some of these things. Is navigation likely to fail? Like a lot of this is what's likely to fail versus what's, um, how big of a deal would it be if it failed? Navigation is important, but maybe you can test the navigation with you know, the routes and an integration test rather than having to go through the UI. I, I didn't put any test pyramid slides on here. I've been talking about that quite a bit recently in other articles that I've posted. But the idea, if you can push it somewhere out of the UI, you're better off. But to get the maximum value for the for focused, maintainable tests, we're going to focus on these six tests. And in the UI, it just looks like this. You've got a sign up button and or sign up field and a sign in field with links to everything. This new address form, I, I did it this way because it's got all of the HTML5 uh, fields on it to really be able to use Selenium to, to demonstrate how you would change things in, in all of the forms. Uh, but the edit address field form looks the same. And that's everything gets displayed. Like there's no CSS on this site. I was just, it's a functional, like, let's just get the features out there. Um, I probably should pay someone to make it nice and pretty for me. The, it just displays the information. So you create it, displays the information, you edit it, it displays the new information. And then there's a list of all of the addresses and with all the links. And this is, if you wanted to, to delete an address, uh, you would click destroy there. All right, so that's kind of the basics of the site. We're going through those six things. So I talked about Atomic. We really want to focus on those six things in isolation as best we can. The problem or the trick, the other limitation here is test data. And test data is a pain. So there's four basic approaches that I categorize test data management into. The first is grab and hope. This is 
there's a product on the site I need to check out. I don't care what I'm checking out with. Grab the first product, put it in the cart, verify I can check out. That's great. Um, one actual problem I faced at the last company is I ran enough tests against the, um, the static site that would deployed this, that the back end showed that the product went out of stock because I kept grabbing the same product. So it ended up in the wrong state. My test started failing and I'm like, my tests are really reliable. What's going on? I'm like, oh, that's kind of funny. Grab and hope isn't always the good thing. One test might be trying to edit it while another test is trying to delete it. If, if you're not careful, grab and hope can be really, uh, really flaky. So one of the fixes that a lot of QA teams do is, is a static reference, right? Like this is essentially the, the, the huge spreadsheets of all of the data and all of the things that you're gonna need to fill things out. So each test has its own data that's, that's generated as part of this huge uh, Excel or CSV file that, that populates everything. And so anytime you create a new test, you have to populate new data into this, this spreadsheet to make sure that all of the data is independent. This is a pain. This does not scale well. This is difficult. Uh, developers do something kind of similar with a dynamic fixture. They just take all of that stuff and put it into a database and then reference the specific items in the database from the test. But it's essentially the same kind of thing. You have to be able to match up the data that you're going, that you're using with the test that, that uses it. So also kind of a pain, doesn't scale super well. The ideal for managing your test data to keep it as maintainable as possible is for every single test to manage all of its own data. Now, it's probably not possible to do this. There's lots of restrictions and limitations and things you know, depending on context. Some people can't create new users on the fly because of reasons. Sometimes you've got a CMS that's managing content that's out of your control. But as much as possible, you want to have completely independent data and set it up per individual test. So one of the things that frustrates me about those uh, spreadsheets and things like that is, is you're hard coding all of this data that just doesn't matter. One of, one of the things that you get with just in time, one of the things that you do is you use a library like Faker that can generate random information for the different fields that matter. So here is an example, and I would normally put this in a, um, a, a POJO, a plain old Java object, but we're going to keep it as map just to keep things simple here. So here's a map of all of these things, key names, values for all of the stuff, and all of the values are dynamically generated. And so every single test that's creating or editing an address is going to generate a new one of these and get brand new uh, information in, or, in order to be able to pass it in. So how does that look? So we have, we're, we're going to test atomically with autonomous data. So this is kind of sorted in, in a, a range act assert or what, it, what Garrickin would be given when then the, the top third is the setup. The middle third is the action and the bottom third is the validation. So these three tests are to test sign up, log out and log in. And if you notice, we have to sign up a second time for test two, and then we have to sign up and log out for test three. So that's a lot of duplication in our code. And people are like, oh, this is way too slow. We shouldn't do this. And my first response is this may, if, you, if you've got separate data and separate users, this makes your code much more robust. This allows us to focus on our maintenance costs rather than our execution costs, even if it were slower. That said, what if we can speed things up? So the traditional web app at the bottom, you've got a model view controller set up and it's generating HTML, it's loading on a page. There's, there's not a whole lot of dynamic things going on, but you're interacting back and forth via the HTML uh, directly. What we're seeing more and more now is microservices or, or whatever the back end is, but there's a gateway, an API gateway that exists between the, the user interfaces and the service layer and the database. And the interesting thing about an API gateway 
is that it works the same for both the web application and the mobile application. They're both generating the same format of JSON payload and sending it to the same endpoints. You know what else can generate a JSON payload and send it to an endpoint? An HTTP client. We don't necessarily have to go through a user interface in order to set state or do validation things with the application. We can do black box the exact same thing without all of the complications and difficulties of generating uh, the, the, the required JSON uh, by interacting with elements in, in the UI. So what this would look like is that instead of signing up for test two, we would like signing up does two things, right? It creates a new user and then it authenticates that user. And then creating the new user is essentially uh, what would happen if you authenticated and logged out. So we don't have to do both those steps for test three. So the problem with this is how do we know that what we're doing with the API here is the same thing that is actually the same thing as what the UI is doing? Uh, this is you know one of the the an article I wrote recently is talking about unit te like testing our assumptions versus testing reality. Are we assuming they're the same and therefore we can use it? Or do we know that there is a reason that these are interchangeable? So first of all, we're getting into some code here, creating a user with the API. Like it's, it's pretty obvious. We all use Selenium probably and, and created and validated and, and all of the rest working with elements and, and, uh, and the Selenium code. This is, I'm using for this the, the HTTP client in Java itself. Uh, it was introduced in Java, I think it was introduced in Java 9 as a beta and was released fully in Java 11. This is one of the reasons Selenium is going to end support for Java 8 next month, uh, because the HTTP client we're using for Java 8 has some problems. And so we're going to say Java 8 is no longer supported. You have to use Java 11 or above. And we're going to use the, the standard uh, Java HTTP client. So it's it's great. So anyway, that's what I'm using here. You're essentially generating the the JSON payload there, and then you're you're uh, uh, passing it in to the endpoint. In this case, it's the user's endpoint. And what we're getting back, I'm I'm parsing the result to get the get a cookie and to figure out a remember token. So essentially, there's a value that comes back when we create the user that tells me how to authenticate it. So this isn't actually part of an API, but you can create a cookie with that token that you get back from the API, and then you just add it as you normally would on the browser. And the trick here is you have to be on the same, you have to be in the same domain uh, as the uh, cookie in order to set the cookie. But but this is a great way to bypass login. I mean. How many of your tests use login? Almost all of them. So if you can find a way to reliably authenticate, like create and authenticate things, even just authenticate things without going through the UI, uh, it, it'll save a lot. So, all right, when, when I'm talking about transitive properties here, this is, I was a math major, just heads up. So there's some a little bit of math nerdery here, but transitive property means that if A equals B, and B equals C, then A equals C. Kind of loosely applying this here, that if you're using the UI to sign up and the result is the user exists and it's authenticated, and then you use the API to create and authenticate and it results in the UI, the user exists and is authenticated. And then we've got, this is just a, the reflexive property, sign up is sign up. So this is if A equals B and C equals B, then A equals C, and then you could do substitution. So we can essentially substitute the sign up in the UI with the API if we've done this validation. So this is setting state. The other interesting bit is being able to do validations, being able to do our assertions. Can we replace our current assertions with um, checking uh, with, with the API? And, Here's an example of, of implementing a validation with the API. Again, we have to use the token uh, in order to interact with the API so that we're, we're securely getting the information from the API. So we get the token. Um, we make sure that we're actually logged in because the token is, is valid. 
And then we, uh, we can use that to make sure that the email for that token matches the email that we created the user with. So same kind of thing, transitive assertions, right? We know that creating and authenticating the user results in correct results in the UI. So if the API actions also can be validated with the API, and we can say that the user existing and authenticated in what we're evaluating in the UI is the same as what we can evaluate with the API. So what this does though, is this essentially means we need to create a fourth test. So the first test is all in the UI. We have to make sure that the UI for sign up does the right thing in the UI for the user existing and authenticated. And then now we need to use the API to make sure that the correct things happen both in the API and in the UI. And these first two tests together allow us to be much more confident that test three and test four are good. Uh, and this is almost always like it's an extra test. It's almost always worth it. And, you know, and even the API test, the API test here might actually be done in a different test suite as well. So that's something to keep in mind. But this one is almost always worth it because you're logging in probably for every single other test, regardless of whether it's an authentication test or not. So it's almost always worth it to add this test just to make sure. And it's, and it's, usually, it's usually a maintainable test. Definitely testing the API is a much more maintainable thing. And then testing the UI from an API is relatively... Uh, relatively maintainable. So it's the same kind of thing for the addresses. Uh, this is testing the create, the edit, and the delete. And the, the idea with this is, oh, I'm, they all require signing up. So I'm, we're, let's just ignore the sign up part. We're gonna be doing what, we, what I showed before of creating a new user and, and authenticating with it. So we're just gonna focus on what we're doing with the addresses here. So same thing, we would like to be able to set state by creating the address. Here we are using the Java HTTP client to pass in the payload of the address values that I'm converting from a map, passing it into the addresses endpoint. And then we're gonna use the, the cookie token that we got from the authentication step in order to make sure that we're adding this address to the proper place. Same kind of thing here. We know that the UI does the right thing. And so if the API can be validated in the UI, then we know that we can replace what is in the, what the creating the address in the, the UI with creating the address in the API. And um, I'll sometimes refer to this just as a, as a fast forward or, or a bookmark. Actually, I think it was Josh Grant that came up with the idea of, of uh, fast forward. I liked it. Uh, the, uh, I was using anchor for a while, not, not quite as descriptive. So I, I like the idea of a bookmark, you're bookmarking a spot and then jumping directly to it. Uh, what you're doing with, with test two here is you are now able to completely all in the API, create a user, authenticate the user, and then create an address and then just navigate to the edit address. And so like most of the flow that was a pain before is now much faster. So same thing, validating, can we do the validation? Here's the validation code, Get, getting an address. Again, need a, need a the, the cookie token and need uh, just getting a list of addresses. It's a get call instead of a post. And then we're just gonna convert uh, the map we get back to the map we're expecting to see. And we're gonna iterate over the, the resulting map in our, in our test uh, to make sure that, that everything matches. It's super easy to do. Especially this is this is huge for big forms like the one that I'm showing because being able to just grab a map and compare a map is so much easier than grabbing every single element and then parsing it for get text. Uh, back when I was doing a lot of that, I ended up using um, in in Ruby. I did um, most of this code. This all of this code is essentially copying what I used to do in, in Ruby into Java, because I was a big Ruby developer for quite a while. And in, in Ruby, we've got a XML parser called Nokogiri, and I think you probably use Jackson in, uh, in Java, but 
the idea being if you grab the nice thing about Selenium's get text method is that it makes sure that the information is displayed on the page. If you do not expect there to be hidden elements in the form result that you're looking at, you could grab the contents of that form, just get the one element, which is the form, and then call get text on that form or get inner HTML or what, whatever it is that you're gonna get from it. And then parse those results with uh, an XML parser uh, that could be that can speed up things quite a bit. That I'm not going over that that code for here, but I've written that code before. I wrote a, a gem called Wada Wadagiri, uh, essentially being able to use water locators uh, for XML for uh, uh, Nokugiri, and it was very powerful, very very uh, very nice. So anyway, that's that's an idea. So again, same same idea with the assertions. If we we know that the what you're doing in the API matches what's in the UI. If it also matches what you get back from the API, then we can say that validating through the UI and validating through the API uh, is essentially going to be equivalent. And so the test we're missing there is creating with the API and then testing both in the API and the UI. So this one might not be as useful because this one might not be as useful because if you only have a couple tests that create an address, it might not be worth doing the evaluation, doing this assertion both in the UI and the API. Maybe it would make sense for the create or for the edit and the delete to always check the UI instead of checking the, the API. But probably not. So like a lot of this is, is depends on how many forms. I, a lot of the places that I worked at uh, just had a lot of forms that we were constantly filling out and validating. If you are spending a lot of time passing in data in different combinations and permutations into forms, I, I highly recommend that you do all of that with an API. You shouldn't need to go through the UI. Like what, what is sending data? Like you've got a, you're creating an address. You're essentially finding ways to set state in the system and then evaluating what happens when that state is set. Setting state should almost like you can set it with an API so much faster and more reliably than through the UI. And so if you have a bunch of those and a bunch of different things, you can do all of that through the API. What you care about with the UI is, is the form functioning correctly? It's, it's one of the many things that I don't love about um, BDD tools is they kind of focus on, even screenplay, a lot of it's focusing on the motivations of the user. And, and in all honesty, the motivation seems kind of unnecessary. I, I care that the form works. I don't really care why you want to use it. I want to make sure that it works. In any scenario that that is available for people to use to set state, and you'll know this, you can monitor your application to see how many people are using which things and which things make more sense to spend time validating. Every, every new test, every new scenario should be, is this scenario or test going to give me additional information that will allow me to be more confident that the release that I'm putting out there uh, is going to be successful, is going to accomplish what we need. So, all right. That is what I have. So I've got a few minutes here for questions. Let's see what we have in the... in the uh, in the chat here. Let's see here. Where's the question? This is the question yep. list. All right. I see the questions list here. Um, oh, wow. We've got a bunch. This is great. All right. Let's run through these. Can you discuss a situation where your transitive testing approach enabled you to adapt swiftly to UI changes and maintain the stability of your test suite? So the idea here is that UI changes are always going to cause a problem. This is the difference between brittle tests and flaky tests. Some people conflate those. A flaky test sometimes passes, sometimes fails, almost always an issue of synchronization and race conditions. The brittle tests are the ones where a legitimate change was made and a previously passing test fails and will never pass again because the site is different. 
And your goal is to create locators and do things so that minor changes won't affect the test. This is why you ideally don't do locators that are evaluating the text on a page, that kind of a thing. Um, so the idea here is that if the UI changes in one place, only one of your tests has to fail. All of the rest can still pass. And so you know right away where was the number. So for instance, I'm still checking login. What happens if there's a problem with the login form? All of the tests that require logging in in my test suite will pass. And then the one test that fails says, oh, actually, we can't log in the normal way. We need to, to figure that out. So that's the idea is focusing in on specific failures and being able to, uh, one, quickly understand where the failure is, validate the problem, be able to reproduce it, and, and then get it fixed. So that's that's the goal uh, for that. Oh, oh, these are even voted on. Great. Uh, journey of transitioning from UI-centric testing to more atomic and autonomous. Honestly, this came pretty quickly. This this did come out of a lot of conversations with uh, uh, you know Santi and and some of the saucers uh, from you know fifteen well not fifteen ten eleven years ago I guess was the first time that I, I met I met them and just thinking about how do we scale things up how do we do less because yeah water really was how can we drive everything in the UI and the more time you spend in the UI the more you just realize it's buggy browsers are hard weird things happen when you've got a browser if you can cut certain pieces of that out and still have the same amount of confidence that the features are working do that as much as possible all right common misconceptions about this i think i don't know i i, I don't know I, i'm the only one i think that's ever used this term so i came up with this but this idea and that's why i really spent time talking about the missing piece of making sure that you're essentially validating the contract. There's a contract between API and UI. And if, and if you're validating that, you should have more confidence. But in general, and I lovingly, lovingly refer to them as legacy QA managers, oftentimes they're never going to be satisfied with automated tests. They don't trust them. And so just being able to say, hey, we need to leverage the computer to do things that the computer is good at. We need to scale it. We need to scale specific important things that we can maintain. Uh, it's it's great that, you know, oh, this every single test, like, oh, this is just one test. It, it won't, it'll, it'll be fine. It won't be buggy. It won't be a problem. And, and then it's just, it all adds up. How does transitive testing contribute to ensuring software reliability and quality? It is just a way to remove the burden of setting state and validating results in as many tests as possible so that you can be focused on the one activity, right? Like it's kind of magic. You magically get to the place you need to be. You evaluate the feature that you're interested in, and then you magically make sure that everything worked correctly. So that's, that's the goal of, and you're doing it more reliably because that magic is much more reliable than going through the UI. So you make sure that you are checking the UI in every single place it needs to be, uh, and then able to do it at scale and in parallel uh, and, and uh, run all of that at the same time. How do you identify and manage transitive dependencies in your testing process? This can be very context dependent too, right? Like it, it really depends on what forms are you using? How, how big are they? What, what are the issues? There's, there's a lot of cool additional magic things that you can do. Um, I wrote some, some code in Ruby that you essentially would have a data object and you would pass it into a method in the page object and it would automatically fill out the form. And then you would pass the data object into the API object and it would automatically validate it, right? So essentially everything's based on the data object. It would match the keys from the data object with the elements on the page object with the fields in the API. And you would just be able to say, do it in the API, validate it in the, the page object, do it in the page object, validate it in the API. And we're able to do that with without, without actually a lot of code. Um, Ruby have, we, we did all meta programming, um, probably do some of that, I haven't spent a lot of time with uh, the Java implementation, but uh, 
definitely can do that with with uh, with some of the um, uh, some of the, the the cool new features in Java. So where are we at? I refreshed and now I lost my place in this list. How do you identify? Okay, that's the one we just talked about. I am I not. Have for yeah. You on the yeah. Go ahead. Um, how to limit transitive closure or static regression test selection approaches? I am not sure what that means. Limit transitive closure for static regression test selection approaches. So, I am going to what I'm going to answer of this is uh, figuring out what you need to test and figuring out what's what's the the minimum that needs to be tested for the maximum benefit or the resources that you have available is very difficult. And one of the goals of this kind of transitive testing of leveraging the API to do as much as possible for you <clears throat> is actually to allow you to expand your coverage for the same amount of resources, right? So especially when I, I see peak teams get cut, you know, especially, you know, this past year, things have been difficult in a lot of places and they're still expected to maintain the same number of, of tests and like, oh yes, we're going to have the same amount of coverage just with, with fewer people. And it's like, unless you have really reliable tests and even that, you probably need to go through your test suite and say, which of these aren't worth maintaining. If you have tests that are failing and you can't, you don't have time to evaluate them, they're essentially causing more problems than they're solving. And so to a certain extent, it makes sense to just not run them or don't focus on the ones that are working so that you get a good strong signal and then as resources permit add things back in or evaluate what's important of the things that weren't providing us value that we can get that additional <clears throat> value back awesome i have one more question can you provide examples or case studies where transitive testing has helped uncover critical issues or improve overall test coverage significantly I only have, you no, know, I have not done any, any analysis or anything wider. I've used, I've done this at one, two, three different companies, four different companies, three different companies. Um, well, no, four, no, three, because one of them, the API definitely wasn't the same, right? Like this is one of those issues. The API and the UI were doing different things. They were setting things differently. And so I couldn't use, I couldn't trust the API to set state and do the validation. I had to go through the UI for everything, which was very frustrating. The other three places I made extensive use of this and it dramatically improved reliability. It, it allowed me to have a lot better coverage uh, for the, and again, it, it executes faster and more reliably. So you kind of get all of it. It's more reliable and it's faster and it allows you to do more for the resources that you have. Um, uh, I think there's not really a question in the Q&A section, but there was some comments going on when you were um, you know, talking about a few stuff. So I think especially relating to AI, right? Right now we have AI yeah. So there are use cases where people right now copy paste the whole raw HTML and then ask ChatGPT to you know, come up with tests even. Yeah. So considering that era, do you like to comment anything on that? Yeah, absolutely. Test creation is the cheapest and easiest thing to do. If you want to use chat GPT or, or an AI tool to do that, that's great. But make sure that what it's generating is something that can be maintained because creating something that's not maintainable is not useful. It's going to all fail again. It's, it's one of the things that I struggle with. I see someone asked a Selenium IDE question. Same kind of thing. And there is a new version of Selenium IDE under development. Um, come, come find us in the Selenium Slack and we can talk about that. But it's the same kind of thing. You end up generating things that then break or fail, and then you have to regenerate them. So you're constantly having to go in and, and validate your own code against what the current correct state is. And that just takes a lot of time and resources that you could be getting useful information to give you confidence about what it is that you're releasing. Amazing. Um, I'm afraid it's almost time, Titus. Thank you so much for your time. Absolutely. And um, there are over, you know, 200 people listening to your talk um, at this time. And, Great. Uh, amazing. And thank you so much, everyone, for joining. I'm sure the session was really insightful with transitive testing, a term coined by Titus. 
I'm sure this will be, uh, you know, quite famous and uh, you know going forward, and a lot of people started using it, right? Um, with us, we want to thank you, Titus, from me and everyone at Lambda Test um, for your time and bringing up some new topic to us. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you very much. Thanks, everyone. See you in the next time.